Cool. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Hope you all have a drink, um, and we're ready to kick off. So, hi everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Neil. I'm a senior data scientist here at Monzo, and this is uh, Sam. Yeah, I'm Sam. I'm an operations analyst here at Monzo. So, you want me to do slides? Uh, yeah, let's go. Let's go. Okay. Is that a clicker? No. I'll do your slides. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, this event is all about how uh, Monzo's Scalers team and Monzo's data team work together to ensure that we're delivering really awesome service for our customers, uh, while allowing Monzo to grow into being a service which is truly different uh, for banking. So we uh, shuffle on. Uh, we have this as our, our team mission, uh, and it's intentionally ambitious. So we want to empower COPS, which you'll hear a lot today. Uh, it means customer operations. So these are the guys that you'll see when you open your app and you tap on help. Um, we've got teams in London, Cardiff, and around the world uh, out there supporting uh, you guys as you use Monzo. So we're empowering COPS to deliver the world's best customer support uh, to a billion customers. And we're doing that through powerful tools and human processes. So it's not just about your traditional contact center where you're churning through people. It's about really empowering and enabling people. So this is the problem. Most customer support sucks. Um, so 57% of people have got so frustrated sitting on hold that they've hung up. Uh, American Express did a study that people were willing to wait 13 minutes on hold before they got an answer. Um, and you forget your pin at your traditional bank and you wait three days for it to show up in the mail. Uh, we genuinely think we can, we can do better than that. So uh, we won't be able to talk about Monzo because of their experience with customer support, not in spite of it. It's about d delivering a service that genuinely enriches people. Um, and that's because we're a customer service company uh, at its heart. We may have a banking license and we may be an app, but like fundamentally we're all about delivering a service that our customers enjoy and enriches them. Um, and this is where it, what happens when it goes well. Uh, you see a, a friendly person, you see their face, you know their personality, and we send people pin reminders in the style of Craig David. Um, it's about be, being different. Um, and when it doesn't work, we're also there. So we have these really, really cute little handwritten cards that we send to customers when we screw up. Um, because it matters that when stuff really doesn't go well, we also own that and take responsibility for that. Um, so where are we now? We have 180 people uh, in our broader customer operations environment, and they're helping our 850,000 customers uh, every single day. Um, and this is how it kind of manifests itself. So we have this lofty ambition to uh, have 100,000 customers be helped by a single frontline customer support agent. At the moment, we're about 19,000. So we have a very, very long way to go. Uh, there's a little dip in the graph when we go to the current account, but we're making really, really strong progress. Um, and our team's goal is really to kind of carry on the curve of this graph so we can deliver much, much better service for our customers uh, in a way that's really efficient and effective. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. So um, Sam said that we're a customer service company with a banking license. I'm going to disagree and say we're a data company <laughs> with a banking license. Um, obviously, I'm in the data team. Um, and before I joined, actually, our head of data, who's back in the office hacking away, uh, wrote this blog post that uh, if you're interested in data teams, you should definitely read. Um, so in this blog post, he talks about what the foundation of the data team is. And effectively, as a team, um, we are behind the scenes all the time. And our mission is to enable everybody at Monzo to make better decisions uh, faster. So what does that mean? That sort of translates into these three principles that we work with. Uh, the first one is about autonomy. So we look to give other teams the power to do everything that they need to do with data themselves. And uh, you'll hear a great example from Sam about that tonight. Um, second of all, the thing that uh, was a big relief, I don't know if any of you are data scientists, but was a big relief for me when I joined Monzo was that all of our data is in one place, that I just can open my laptop and I have all of our anonymized data at my hands. And then finally, this core concept that we work uh, in all of our data science work is that nothing is ever going to happen once. So maybe, uh, let's say, a, a lending team comes to us and says, how are our overdrafts doing this month? And we could do a one-off analysis and say, yeah, they're doing pretty well. Um, and then a scalers team comes to us and says, 
how, how many customers are getting in touch with us, and we could do that once and give them the answer. But in actual fact, all of these questions are going to happen time and time again. So we always think about how can we build our data infrastructure in a way that maybe even one day the scalers will be able to know about how uh, many conversations we get from people that we lend to, and so on. So this idea of uh, data-driven insights being done once and um, you having to go to your data team for some answers and insights is something that we're trying to avoid. Um, so I know that uh, structuring a data science team is something that's a little bit contentious across companies. If you go to a data science conference, it's typically like the most discussed thing. And here at Monzo, we're sort of operating as a distributed and a centralized team at the same time. Uh, so what do I mean by that? I mean that every single member of the data team will also sit on another team. So I've been sitting with scalers uh, quite often. And uh, in practice, in our day-to-day -day work, that means that we do a range of things. And I've split it across these uh, two axes. On the one hand, uh, our, our job is there to inform the team that we're with, uh, give them data, empower them, um, and then all the way to the stuff that I get really excited about, which is uh, building machine learning features. And then the other axis of thinking about it is, are we working with products, whether it's our app or the internal products uh, that our cops have, or are we working more towards helping uh, other teams in the business make uh, good decisions? Uh, so with that, I think we have a few case studies that we'll, we'll quickly run through, and Sam, you're the first one. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of our big challenges uh, when um, the team is as large as it is, so with um, more than 100 people uh, scattered around the world, is making sure that we're managing and measuring uh, performance and output in a way which is really beneficial and positive to our customers. Um, so this is kind of where we started. Um, we thought of customer support as a single box. Uh, and we looked at averages, and we kind of knew we were doing all right. Uh, we hired really great people, and we kind of let them loose uh, to go out and support our customers uh, from the start. And that was really great. Uh, and then we reached kind of a, a tipping point where we realized that this, we were starting to see a few issues. You know, Customers were waiting a bit longer for a reply. Uh, we felt that maybe our quality was taking a little bit of a dip in some areas that we didn't want it to. Um, so we went to completely the other extreme. And we broke the team down into individuals uh, and looked at literally every data point we could get our hands on uh, and kept the data team very happy with all kinds of crazy requests. Um, and in the end, that doesn't really work either, because you can't really draw any kind of inference from this chart. Maybe blue is getting slightly more prevalent to the right, but really, who knows? Um, looking at individuals really doesn't help you either. So when you drill down into it, we got to this model of fifths, where like we can understand the things and the behaviors that really drive people when we segment our team down into understandable but statistically diverse teams. And what this means is that we can arrange our team uh, from our kind of uh, highest performing 20% uh, down to a, a group of 20% that maybe require a little bit more support um, or that could learn from the rest of the team. Um, so this is where, where we end up. We can see kind of the spread across our team, the, the range of performance and the variation that we see. But that in itself isn't that useful. It might be useful as a management metric, but it doesn't really help us drive Monzo forward and deliver better service for our customers. So this is what we do with it. We try and understand the habits of highly effective customer operations staff and share them across the business. So we see, for example, that um, so a little peek behind the curtain. We have a, a concept of saved responses where because very few conversations that customers come in with are 100% unique, we can offer up to our staff some suggested responses that might solve that customer's problem. Uh, and we see that kind of use of saved responses ticks up as people are more productive. Um, similarly with keyboard shortcuts, if you're not clicking around, you can be slightly more effective uh, and help slightly more customers and deliver an even better service. But the thing that's really interesting here is that you might often notice that quintile five uh, are really star players, are actually very different to the rest of the group. So whereas we'd been out there uh, trying to get everyone to learn from our highest performers, we realized that that wasn't the right model, because our high performers were effective in spite of their behaviors, not because of it. So what we can do is pair up some of our people in uh, our first quintile with actually our quintile four or three people, because they're the people that are exhibiting the really highly effective habits. So by understanding the performance and the drivers, we're able to share those 
across the team. So we have this, this document, which is a bit of a Bible within the team, of literally all the things that highly effective people can do. Um, and by combining that qualitative data that we gather through our internal tooling um, and through other systems that uh, COPS use every day, with human management and support and training and guidance, we're able to produce really clear steps for people uh, as they grow in their Monzo journey and as they support more customers to be able to move forward and um, support more customers. So we tie data together with human factors to um, create a better outcome for our customers, which we think is really cool. Um, and then there's this other thing, which um, is sometimes at the, the other end of the, the spectrum. So when things don't quite work so well for us, um, this is kind of how uh, Monzo support worked about six months ago. So our customer would send in a message, and it would go into kind of this uh, pool, um, which everything went into. And then all of our staff would just kind of take the, the longest waiting conversation from it. And while that was very fair in making sure that everyone waited kind of roughly the same amount of time, it was also relatively inefficient. Um, and because people would go into the pool to pick up their own conversations, you'd often end up with the perception that people could go in and pick up really easy ones. Whether that was true or not, it sowed like, that extra seed of doubt that like, that person over there is super effective because they always go for the easy questions. Um, so we wanted to see what we could do about that. Uh, and that's what we called on the data team to, to lend a hand. Yep. So this was actually the, one of the first projects that I worked on when I uh, joined Monzo. And I was super excited by this idea. Um, because although, um, from your perspective, when you message customer support, um, you'll just be put in touch with, um, with a cop, uh, behind the scenes, we could do all sorts of things. We could split our cops up in different teams. We could uh, route them. Uh, we could give certain cops certain questions. There are all sorts of ideas that, that were floated around. And to start going down this path, um, we built a very simple MVP, right? So um, when a customer would get in touch, uh, there would be that queue of all their messages. And then based on these thresholds, we would assign uh, different conversations to different queues. And so this was just really a very basic equation based on how many cops were in a team, uh, what level of productivity they were trying to hit. And um, so messages would then get um, rooted in accordingly. So this was um, a thing that we built into our system, and we ran it initially as an experiment with a subset of our, of our COPS. And the feedback that we got was actually very positive. People felt um, very empowered having their own queue. They, they could see the effect that they were having on the, the messages, that the conversations we were receiving. They could, um, they could talk collectively as a team about, look, we have these 100 messages that have just popped up. Let's all smash these and get back to our customers right away. So the sentiment was very positive. Then we went and uh, dove into the data. Uh, and unfortunately, the message wasn't quite the same. So uh, you see, this is just a snapshot from a similar document uh, where we summarized all of the results. But basically, what it was telling us was that there was no effective difference uh, between this new system that we had built and the old one. So uh, the cops weren't necessarily helping more customers. Um, they weren't necessarily getting harder conversations. Um, you know, a, a whole variety of these dimensions, which we regularly analyze, were just simply reanalyzed in the context of uh, did uh, this conversation go into a squad queue or did it go into our old system? And uh, based on that, we actually made the difficult decision to not continue with this uh, project, uh, namely because to carry on with it was an investment that we had to make uh, from an engineering perspective, from a maintenance perspective. And the data wasn't sort of hinting that this was going the way that we wanted it to go. So um, on that note, that's, we, we put the, the, the project that didn't quite work in the middle so that uh, we can end on a positive note. Uh, in the data team, we also look at the other end of this problem. So um, in, in this two-sided world, we have our cops that we want to help them to become as productive as possible, build tools for them uh, to help them. But then on the other hand, we have all of our uh, amazing customers. And although we will never get rid of uh, the ability for any of them to get directly in touch with us via chat, 
Uh, the ideal s situation that we envisage is that if you need help about something, that help is already there on the help screen uh, instead of you needing to get in touch with us. So we teamed up with uh, the scalers team that is looking specifically at this problem. And um, this help screen screenshots actually are maybe a few weeks old from a previous conference I talked at. And they're actually out of date now. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so, but anyway, the, the, the main idea is that, as you, as you probably know, when you get to the help screen, you see all these suggested pages that have uh, some help content on them. So if you've forgotten your PIN, you can search uh, that you've forgotten your PIN, or you can navigate through the articles. And there it is, the, um, what you need to do in order to reset your PIN. Um, but one of the things that we found was that, uh, obviously, in the context of a pin, there are many different things that could happen. Maybe your pin isn't working, maybe you've forgotten it, um, all sorts of things. And so when customers would search, uh, they would get to a number of different pin results and maybe not necessarily the right one. So we were actually imposing this, this effort for people to find the things that, that they would need to help themselves. So, how could we help customers to uh, spend less effort but get the benefit of all of that help content that we have there? And uh, so again, we brainstormed a number of different things and, and a, a simple idea came up, which is why don't we just group the articles that are most similar to each other uh, and put them together? And so uh, we decided to, to have a go at that one. And of course, the natural question that comes up is how do you figure out which articles are similar to each other? So the absolute uh, simplest way, uh, in the app you see all these uh, different categories. Um, and so we said, okay, if an article is uh, put in the same category, then these two articles are about the same thing. Um, might not necessarily be the case, but uh, you know, all the account articles are together. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, there's this machine learning approach that I'm not going to go into any of the math today. Um, but it's this cool concept uh, called word embeddings. And um, effectively, what that does is it translates uh, words into numbers. And um, those numbers are similar to each other if the words are similar to each other. So um, you can imagine then that a I forgot my pin sentence, if you translate it into words, and the my pin is blocked sentence, if you translate it into numbers, those numbers will roughly be close, right? Like, uh, whereas change my address, the numbers are very different. So that's the key concept of a word embedding, and it's used now in many different areas of natural language processing. So we could use that to build a system that will automatically figure out which articles are similar to each other just based on what words they have in them. So again, we put this to the test. Um, if you've been using our app in the last few months, you may have sometimes seen, uh, I forgot my pin screen that looks like this one on the left with nothing, which is the original uh, version of the product. And other times, you would see these related articles. And those related articles could have been uh, put together by this machine learning model. They could have been put together by the simpler version that I told you about earlier. And so the key success metric for us was, uh, are people coming to the help screen, navigating around, finding what they need, and then deciding that they don't need to chat with us? Um, so that's the key signal that we're working with. And we were really happy that um, the really simple method actually had a very statistically significant difference in how many people were getting in touch with us just because we were surfacing uh, this content to them. The, the machine learning model, which uh, is below, um, still nudged things down a little bit, but not as uh, significantly as I was hoping for. But such is life. Um, so still a work in progress. And, um, and we're, we're off of the back of that, we've, um, we've imagined all sorts of other features where we can integrate data and machine learning, and particularly looking at uh, what are the things that people are clicking on, what are they searching for, uh, in order to make their next experience with the help screen even better. So uh, just to wrap up, um, like I said at the beginning, the data team's mission is about enabling better decisions faster. So what that meant uh, and continues to mean for us is that we automate certain things. 
Um, we build systems that do some machine learning so that no human ever has to manually categorize articles ever again. Uh, but then also we, uh, we maintain that foundation, or what we see as the, the foundation of Monzo, which is the, all of our data about customers so that we can uh, quickly pair up with other teams. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was really interesting. So um, this is all kind of with a singular purpose, which is how can we support Monzo to get to kind of our next milestone of a million customers and way beyond that. So we're a, a real force for good in the UK and, and global um, banking environment. And a lot of that is going to involve the people that you interact with uh, in Monzo, but also the fact that you can just go about using Monzo for your entire time and just never need to chat to us. Just like, Everything works, and if it doesn't, you're able to like um, find an answer instantly and get on with your day without having to worry about this stuff. Um, and on our side, that means that the complexity keeps rising. Uh, we, I mentioned at the start about the challenges of like traditional contact centers, um, and in many cases, like you go to these places and they're just not what Monzo aligns to, uh, and that means that a lot of the things we've got to do, we've got to do from the bottom up. Um, you think about something like scheduling shifts, and it's a problem that millions of businesses across the UK and the world are contending with every day. But when you're doing it with 24-7 uh, support, with a globally distributed team, um, and with a real commitment on staff quality and like allowing people to take a break or like uh, take a day off to see their family like whenever they need to, um, these things suddenly become way more complex. So like all of your normal considerations as a company suddenly become opportunities for us to explore. So we can enable kind of 10x efficiency through building our own workforce management tooling and by kind of starting so many of these problems from first principles. So there's a whole lot of work to do, um, but we're really excited to see where the next uh, year and beyond take Monzo, customer support, and your experience with the app and the service. Thanks. So we're here for all of your questions. And uh, we can probably uh, find someone to answer them if we don't know the yep. answer. Naji has a, a microphone at the back, uh, so he'll be passing that around. I think we've also got some questions on the live stream that we'll pop to every now and then. Throw it. Mm -hmm. I'll repeat your question. Um, so, uh, the idea of having um, help articles in an app um, and categorizing them sounds like it might be something that a lot of different companies face. I was wondering what there is in terms of off-the-shelf solutions that will, that will employ machine learning to do these kind of things. Yeah. Uh, so, actually, the machine learning model that we used is a machine learning model that was uh, trained and open-sourced by Google, I think. Um, so, if you, if you look up uh, word to vec pre-trained model, you'll find it there. Uh, and so this model has been trained on millions of Google News articles. And, um, and now there is this increasing trend of, of open sourcing uh, pre-trained machine learning models uh, that you can then just tailor specifically to your problem. Uh, so uh, while that is uh, definitely on the rise for text, it's uh, even more common for images. Right, so there are services where you can, you know, is this a cat or a dog in my picture type of thing. Monza's not quite there yet. Um, but the, the whole idea in the machine learning community is becoming very, very mainstream. Poor Naji. <laughs> Someone want to help him? No. Hello. You talked about um, sort of uh, segregating your employees into so the top quartile and matching the top quartile, the bottom quartile. How do you make sure the bottom quartile customer service agents sort of buy into using your system and whatnot? Yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting point. So um, we take incredibly seriously kind of staff satisfaction. Uh, we are incredibly proud that our retention rate is um, like frankly ridiculous. Uh, we've had like single digit number of cops leave ever. Um, and we like put a massive value on training and development and learning. Um, and it's often the case that if somebody 
is in Quintile 1, then actually they're really fantastic at something else. So you've got a lot of people in that group that are like really interested in complaints, for example, and are going to go off and become amazing complaint handlers. Uh, but actually, in the meantime, like getting to grips with frontline support is super important. Um, so because we kind of approach it in a positive way, where it's about improving your abilities and improving the out experience for the customer, um, we generally haven't found this to be a particularly uh, hard challenge to get people bought in on, simply because we're all here with the singular goal of delivering really awesome service for our customers. And if we're like providing a bit more support to someone so that they can do that even better, in many cases, that's an opportunity for them rather than like calling them out. Yeah, do you want to use this? Um, hello. Um, so you said that there are some answers that are highly effective to typical questions. To what degree do you plan to automa automate the answers? Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to lead? Yeah, sure. Um, that's a very good question. Um, so right now, um, you won't ever get answered by a bot. Uh, but instead, we flipped that, um, that question on its head and uh, built tools internally um, that help cops to recognize that this is a question that we receive very often. Um, so my colleague, Nigel, who I don't think is here, um, built a, a system that when you uh, message uh, a cop will look at your message and say, oh, I think this is a pin reset question. Here are our saved responses for pins. So it's treating it as a recommendation problem for the cop, saying these are the answers we suggest to you. And so uh, ultimately a human decides on the answer. Uh, and tailors it to you and maybe changes the answer if you were asking for more things. Um, but it's a really interesting uh, opportunity for automation because we can help the human be faster and not have to remember, oh, pin is that saved response over there that I need to go and dig up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, like Exactly right. We, we kind of subscribe to the principle of cyborgs rather than robots. So I'm really, really powerfully enabled stuff. Uh, which like gets you right up to that level, but it's still a human making that call. Um, Chatbots at the moment just don't seem to be good enough to deliver the quality of service that we uh, hold ourselves to. Um, so at the moment, it's it's all about empowering our stuff. Do you have any cross sell or upsell components to your customer service strategy, or is it entirely based on being reactive to what they are asking? Uh, no, um, we, we're really lucky that at the moment Monzo is a relatively straightforward product. Um, it's a current account. If you're like really crazy, you might have a joint account. Uh, but like <laughs> these things are like relatively straightforward uh, products that we don't need to go into kind of upselling or cross selling. Um, so we're really pleased that at the moment our primary focus can be on that kind of support aspect rather than needing to kind of distract people with uh, shiny promotions. Can I just add yeah. to that? Um, the one thing that we do internally, though, is when a new feature is going to be released, we, uh, we set the stage for that. So we know that joint accounts are going to be launched, or, and so you know, the cops are given briefings. Probably Sam has prepared them um, to give people the heads up. So we, we can even anticipate, oh, OK, this feature is going out this week, so let's all be ready to answer questions about it. Um, um, sorry, do you want to go first? <laughs> you can go first, you're at the back. All right, uh, it's just a simple question. I'm just wondering, within Monzo, different areas in Monzo, where do you uh, foresee applying machine learning to in the future? Well, that one's for me then, huh? Um, uh, I'm, I'm a very biased person to ask that question to, because I'll sort of say everywhere. Um, I. I think, uh, in general, machine learning is uh, a, a very powerful enabling tool that makes uh, that changes a product from like it um, it kind of working to like it working in an amazing way for you. Uh, so I'm a huge Spotify fan and open up my Discover Weekly every Monday morning, and uh, so in that case, their machine learning is 
is the difference between just having somewhere cool where I can play my music and somewhere that I want to go and open their service every week. Uh, so I feel the same way about Monzo, that, that we have a lot of awesome data. And the view we're taking is on this you know, two-sided front of like what awesome things could we build for our customers who are using the app. Um, may it be a better help experience, maybe smarter notifications, I don't know. Um, and then the other side being how could we help uh, all of our internal tooling. So uh, the data team has already also done some work with financial crime and detecting fraudulent behavior, um, scheduling, we mentioned. Um, so all sorts of stuff. So I, I see it as early days for machine learning at Monzo, but uh, with a very solid foundation. So you guys have mainly talked about how you work across like support. Is there currently any other areas of the business that you work in or would like to sort of expand working together in the future? Uh, so scalers work across kind of the whole of operations, which is primarily support by scale. Uh, but that also encompasses a bunch of other things. So we've got a uh, like partner operations, which is thing like sending out cards, um, financial crime, complaints, uh, the kind of human side of lending, so recovering. Uh, and supporting people that are maybe struggling to pay back their overdrafts. But data work with an awful lot more people. Uh, so yeah, like I mentioned, we have this uh, matrix structure where every person in the data team also works in another team. So uh, I think right now we have a couple of people in scalers, finance, uh, lending, uh, product. Have I missed anyone? I think that's it. Um, and so. This covers a very wide range of different uh, data science type of activities as well, right? So uh, in product, it's uh, a lot about uh, understanding our users and evaluating our experiments, all the way to the stuff that I talked about today with machine learning in scalers. So I think um, you might have opened an office recently in Wales uh, with some of the support team. Has that brought any new challenges that you hadn't necessarily come across before? Uh, yeah, so uh, in January we opened a new office right in the heart of Cardiff. Um, it's a really lovely place and we've got uh, a fantastic team of about 30 uh, cops out there now. Um, and we've been really, really pleased with how well our culture has transferred. Um, so Monzo is uh, a slightly atypical organization, uh, certainly for banks. Uh, and we've been really, really pleased that um, they're kind of really supporting and um, helpful and uh, engaged culture has managed to spread to Cardiff. Um, setting up a new office is always tough. Uh, and certainly kind of getting things off the ground is a really big challenge. Uh, but like, you now would have no idea in the app, you're speaking to a, someone in Cardiff, someone in London, someone in their living room at home. Um, so like, it's been a, a really positive experience for us and where we're gonna continue growing customer ops. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Um, so you've got 850,000 customers and you've got 180 cops. Do you see the data uh, populated by those customers be used as extension of perhaps financial advice by those cops in the future? Are there plans to utilize the data produced by us, the people that use it, to then enable us to, to use our money better in the future? So I think there are definitely plans for Monzo to be kind of a, a hub for your finances. So our company uh, mission is to make money work for everyone, and a current account is a very small part of someone's kind of financial life cycle. Um, so I think there are definitely opportunities for us to support you with your data, but um, we're certainly not in the business of uh, monetizing your data or, or um, sticking ads in the app. Like where we think data is really valuable is in enriching a customer's experience. So if we can see that your energy bill is significantly more than everyone else that has a very similar profile to you, then we might be able to support you and say like, hey, have you like, checked this, like you might have a leak. Um, so like we can use our data really smartly, but uh, we want to use it in ways that enrich and support people. Yeah, I'll just add a little bit to that. Um, I think 
uh, one of the, the things that I've heard uh, very often since joining here is, is how, would we re how would we build this if we were building it for the first time? And so there are many areas of banking that we don't want to just take the existing approach and, and reapply it. And uh, this is where data could play a critical factor. So imagine someone who has like zero credit history and therefore is not eligible for an overdraft. Um, then maybe just sort of seeing them use the Monzo app for a, a week or a few weeks could give us some insight into um, whether they should be eligible for an overdraft. So um, these are the kinds of ideas that are really early stage and sort of aspirational. But uh, like Sam said, um, we sort of need to finish that burnification list <laughs> first and, and build all of the things that you would expect from a, a, a normal bank uh, in order to then move on to the next phase. Were there some questions up? Oh, sorry. Um, just quickly. <clears throat> um, in terms of on the data side, yeah. do you find that you have enough resources to address all of the sort of problems you'd like to solve? And if not, how do you prioritize between different projects and stop small requests um, ad hoc? We definitely don't uh, <laughs> at all. Uh, we're a small team of, uh, I, well, when I interviewed, there were two people in the data team. When I joined, there were four. Uh, and I think we're at six now. Um, but this, I guess, uh, we recognize that a data team is never going to, just like customer uh, operations, is never going to scale uh, to the size of, of a company that's super huge, right? So in my previous company, the there were engineers, there were like a thousand of them, and there were still only 20 data scientists. So this shifts our perspective away from doing the work and, and more towards enabling the work. Uh, and, and I think that's a really powerful concept. So um, if someone comes and says, you know, we need you to do this project, uh, then investing the time up front to teach them how to do it, um, it pays off much more than, than doing it for them. So it, it might be a tiny bit slower in the short term, but it accelerates quite quickly. And um, speaking from personal experience, I've I paired with a bunch of different people here at Monzo now and, and seen them progress from being a person who is maybe hesitant or reluctant to look at data and understand it all the way to someone being like, hey, I pivoted this table and joined it that way and blah, blah, and look at this awesome graph, right? So that's a success story to me, um, is, is, is them starting to do uh, take a data-driven mindset without relying on, on us as the data team to do that kind of stuff. I know you've been waiting. Yeah. I want, um, hi. I just want to find out what are your next data-driven projects to solve our problems, for example? Oh, wow. Bruno, should I give it all away? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Bruno's uh, the PM who's working on the team that I mentioned uh, with the help screen. And so uh, in the last few weeks, we've actually been looking at, um, actually, there's a blog post coming out about some of this stuff this week, so I'm not giving it all away. Uh, but. We've been starting to explore a number of other help uh, cases where uh, some machine learning could help. Um, so two of them. Uh, one of them is uh, that right now on the help screen, you get these suggested articles. And they get suggested to you based on a number of rules. Uh, so a very simple one is if you've frozen your card, then you get suggested the how do I unfreeze my card uh, page. Um, but you know. Uh, this one, it, it, it doesn't lead to a very personalized experience, right? So we've done some early work that shows that we can predict which help articles you'll actually want to see um, when you come to the uh, home screen. Um, the second one, which is uh, very interesting for me as well, is that um, right now, when you go to the help screen, you see your last three transactions. Uh, and you can say, you know, I have a problem with this transaction, or you can go and find the one that you have a problem with. And we've seen a lot of trends in the transactions people have problems with. Um, and so we're 
we've done some early stage work again on like actually trying to predict which transaction you have a problem with and could, you, could we surface something so that you can resolve it yourself, right? This is a duplicate, for example. Like that's something that we can, we can detect quite easily. So um, one day in the future, I see every Monzo customer having their own help screen that's been fully tailored to them, uh, but it's gonna come one little step at a time. <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, cool. So I've got a quick question around um, scalability uh, in light of your ambitions of you know uh, one million bomb billion um, target. So I fully agree with you that right now chatbots are probably not smart enough um, to where they should be in in relation to human interaction and that that mark of great customer service. I think um, you know humans can right now uh, be the best you know the best way to serve that. But when you get to you know one billion customer, uh, you know the end ambition, how feasible do you think that's going to be in reality to have human interaction to serve those, those that 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 size of the customer base? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting one. Um, I think we're here at the right time. Um, over the next few years, we're going to see this kind of stuff get a lot better. Um, so like, while at the moment a lot of automation solutions aren't great, um, it's very possible that uh, with scale. Uh, with time, they improve. Uh, the other really interesting things are, if you look at a company like uh, Apple, who have uh, like a billion active iOS devices out there, and they actually deliver really, really awesome support. And you can like walk into an Apple shop, and they'll just swap your phone. Um, it's crazy. So like, it's still really possible to do great support at scale. Um, but where scale, where it becomes most useful at scale, is that people just never need to get in touch with us. Like your experience of Monzo should be so seamless and perfect that like while you know there's a really helpful person sitting in the app waiting for you, um, you just never need to chat to them because everything is just great. Um, so like with scale, delivering personal customer support becomes really tough. Um, but like I think with the kind of twin pieces of uh, improving technology and um, just kind of reducing the amount of need that people will have to get in touch with us, then we really can do this stuff at scale and differentiate from a lot of what's out there. Cool. Are we good? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Well, thanks very much. Have uh, another beer. Yeah, help yourself to any food that's left. <laughs> <laughs>